everyone. Welcome to SIGPIC. I'm super excited that you joined our webinar today with Marion Baller. We're going to talk about Switzerland's new corporate law and everything you need to know in that regard as a startup or investor. Um, just a quick intro about myself. I will be moderating this webinar. Um, I'm a board member at SIGPIC and co-lead at the SIGPIC Academy. And in my professional life, I'm the founder and managing director of Embark Law, a law firm specializing in advising high growth startups. So a quick thank you to our sponsor, Erz Gönner Stiftung. Um, they are supporting the SIGPIC Academy from day one. So um, yeah, a big shout out. Thanks a lot. And you know, before we kick it off, just a short intro about SIGTIC and SIGTIC Academy. For those who don't know what SIGTIC and the SIGTIC Academy is here, it's what you, what you need to know. So SIGTIC is the largest angel investor community in Switzerland with more than 500 members consisting of in, amazing individual investors and the most prominent VCs in the industry. And our mission is to match smart money investors with the best early stage tech startup and we hold several pitching events um, throughout the year. So if you're looking for investment or networking opportunities, then look no further. So we have a couple of upcoming events. Um, the next um, invest day, um, already next week at Winterthur. So if you haven't signed up yet, then yeah, please reach out to us. We would be super excited to have you. Then uh, on February 16, uh, tech webinar and uh, we're gonna talk about the new vertical at SIGTIC and then we have a uh, great invest days at Zurich and at Lausanne on March 9 and April 5. And um, just quick words about the SIGTIC Academy. Um, we have launched the Academy two years ago and then um, we hold regularly webinars. We have published some YouTube videos, so please check out our YouTube channel. Um, we have also published the Angel Investor Handbook, um, so please check it out. It's free to download. And monthly, we now have Angel, the Sictic Angel Investor Days, where you can um, join and mingle with our lead investors at Sictic and learn about how to become a lead investor. And um, just a quick, um, just a quick, um, um, yeah, um, um, shout out to our startups who pitch at our events. Um, if you haven't, you know, applied for and um, to pitch at SIGTIC, then please consider applying at SIGTIC. Um, you find all, you know, the information that you need to apply on our website and all the criteria. So please check it out. And then um, we would be, you know, really excited to have you on one of our SIGTIC events. So, and now without further ado, let's jump into our webinar. So Marion is an experienced kick-ass venture deal M&A corporate attorney at Walder Wies with an impressive track record and we are super stoked to have her on our webinar and talk about you know, the new corporate law and the important changes for startups and investors. And yeah, the stage now is yours, Marion. Um, thank you very much. I hope you can see the slides. Um, um, hello, of course, also from my side. And thank you very much for joining today's webinar and, of course, for spending your lunch break with us. Thank you also very much, Michelle, for the kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be here today. As you may or may not know, it took our parliament more than 15 years to revise our corporate law. I am therefore very excited that we can finally speak about some of the core changes which entered into force this year. The revision brings with it many updates and modernization to the legal framework that governs Swiss stock corporations. The new provisions will not significantly affect the startup world overall. There are, however, a few key changes that are of significance for all of you as well, and I'm very eager to discuss those today. Um, as 
Michelle already mentioned, I'm Marian and I'm an attorney at Valdebis. I am a member of our startup desk, which was set up around 10 years ago. I advise startups and investors on all corporate related aspects, including many financing rounds. In 2022, I have, for example, advised Planted Foods and Terra Quantum on very large financing rounds. Each was above 75 million Swiss francs. I have also helped UBS and Balwas to successfully acquire a majority stake in Housie through an additional investment. As a full service law firm, we are able to provide support that is tailored to the individual needs of startups and investors. And we at Walder Reese believe in efficiency through specialization. This means that each and every member of our startup desk is an expert in his or her area of law and is very well familiar with the venture capital market. Now I would like to dive into today's topic. Um, um, one of the, of the key changes is certainly that companies have now a lot more flexibility to structure their share capital. What has remained unchanged is that the minimum amount of 100,000 Swiss francs still needs to be covered. Already before the revision, a company was allowed to keep its books in a different currency. This then affected all corporate related aspects as everything needed to be converted. For example, when one needed to assess whether the company is over indebted or to calculate the dividend. These inconsistencies can now be eliminated because under the new law, the company is also allowed to keep its share capital in a foreign currency if certain requirements are fulfilled. In particular, it needs to be material for the business and the accounting has to be done in the same currency. It should be what, kept, sorry. So what does that exactly mean? You know, it's, it's, it's much easier to basically assess whether there is a capital loss or the company is over indebted or, what does that exactly mean? Yes, before you always had these in, inconsistencies because you had the, the functional currency in the books, which was maybe US dollar. But then um, <clears throat> um, when you wanted to distribute dividends, um, this still needed to be calculated also um, by referencing Swiss parameters because there are, are of course, some some amount of the shared capital that you may not distribute. And because the share capital was in Swiss francs, you always had to basically have two separate bookkeepings um, to, to keep um, track um, on, on what exactly that means. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, Thank you, Marion, clarifying but, that. And what um, needs to be kept in mind is that not all currencies are permitted. Um, so the, the directive issued by the Federal Council currently only lists the five most traded currencies in the world. Um, this was primarily to ensure that no weak currency is used. And then at the later stage, the, the minimum share capital of 100 Swiss francs is not covered anymore if it, if it loses too much in value. Um, company may of course already be directly incorporated with a share capital in a foreign currency, but it's also possible to change at the later stage for an existing company. This may always be done as per the date of the new business year. And Maren, do you think, do you think, you know, that will be, you know, relevant for, for, for the startups, you know, I don't know, like if, and if it's relevant, you know, at what stage do you think, you know, it will become relevant. Um, yeah, that's a, a good question. I think um, if it's it's relevant for those companies who do a lot of business abroad and who have a lot of claims and receivables in a specific currency. So I would imagine that for early stage um, startups that are based in Switzerland, it will not have or it will not be that sig significant yet because mostly you focus on the Swiss market probably and then you expand. But maybe at the later stage when, when you see, for example, the, the US market is, is very attractive and then you focus your business on that market and that's 
probably something when, when you might want to consider to to change everything to US dollars. And I don't know if you remember, you know, we quickly talked about this, you know, um, like yesterday that actually, you know, today, a lot of startups are have, you know, a nominal value, you know, in Swiss francs, but raising capital, you know, in US dollars or other foreign currency. Is that, you know, is that going to change or, you know, is, is that, can that system still be applied going forward? Um, yes, def definitely. There's no reason to not do so. So um, we see it quite often that a company, of course, has to share capital in Swiss francs before there were anyway no other possibilities. But then to agree on a on an issue price in the financing round that is in euro or US dollar. Um, the practical hurdle here is to find a bank that is willing to open a blocked account in the relevant currency. But at least the, the big players, they are typically quite open to do so, at least when a, a more co common currency is, is, is requested, such as US dollar or, or euros. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and, and another big change is that um, a company may not also issue shares um, that have a nominal value which is smaller than one Swiss cent. The rationale for, for this change was to introduce or to facilitate share splits. But honestly, other than this, we do not see a lot of, of benefits. Um, in particular, uh, tiny nominal value and the corresponding huge number of shares will add an additional layer of complexity in the cap table of a company. And for startups, which often have already a very complex and super dynamic cap table, this might not really be um, a desired outcome. So you, you wouldn't recommend, you know, startups to basically issue like a gazillion shares just because they can do it? No, honestly not. Um, we see it already with, with startups that have um, um, one cent as a nominal value. Um, it's just a lot of calculation, a lot of rounding when you when you move on around. I think probably like a good start would be 10, 10 cent. And then you could still do a share split to to one down to one Swiss cent. So you have that option. And I, I think over the lifespan span of a startup, you will not do 20 share splits, hopefully. So um, maybe then you, you still have the option to, to go to one Swiss cent, but that, that should be sufficient. But we also see a lot of startups that already start with one Swiss cent, but smaller than that, I would not. Okay. So, so you believe yeah, the current like best practice to start either at one cent or 10 cents is not going to change going forward. I, I, I think so. I, I think I see also companies that have one Swiss francs, but that might not be granulated enough. So you want probably to go a bit lower, but but yes, 10 Swiss cents and one cent seem to be a good option for um, based on my view. And do you think, you know, it, you know, it could like in like, for instance, like in the US, you know, you have much, you know, lower nominal values you know you think you know for companies who think about you know i don't know um setting up company in switzerland maybe like doing a flip at some point to the us does it make sense you know to them you know to you know have a lower nominal value to basically adjust to the nominal value you know in the us and i mean same applies to maybe companies who who intend to move to other jurisdictions I think I mean, when you move to another jurisdiction, there's anyway a lot of complexity involved. And I think it, it would be preferable to change at that time to, to the requirements of the new law. Um, because anyway, you need to pay in the, the capital in Switzerland. So um, this, this won't change. Um, therefore, I would, as long as you're in Switzerland, I would probably um, remain at, at one, one Swiss centim um, at the lowest. Makes sense, at least. Yeah, to whatever you know, whatever you may encounter, you know, along the way, then you know, deal with that issue and not plan maybe, you know, um, too much ahead. Um, ex exactly. Yes. Um. Ah. Uh. Um, Marion, we have a question from from um from H. I don't know what his real name is. It's just H. So it 
you know, it um, concerns the last the last bullet point. Share capital may be paid in cash, contribution kind, or by virtue of set off. You know, has anything you know changed in that regard? You know, um, compared to you know the you know the old corporate law. Um, there was one big change in in relation to the payment of the share price in relation to set off, and I'm gonna talk about this um, in detail. I'm in the, in the next couple of slides, so I will I will not go into that that now. And other than that, it has it essentially remained the same. Um, maybe to what is worth mentioning here is that um, the um, the absichtige Sachübernahme, so the intended acquisition in kind, um, no longer is a qualified um, item when incorporating or making a capital increase. This often lead, led to very complex structures because you had to value and then um, it was super complex. So this is not um, not applicable anymore. That's maybe what I can add here. But I will get to the set off a bit later, which because this is a super important change in particular for this community. Okay, then let's let that's go. Um, what is of course also very re relevant for, for startups and investors is how um, the share capital of a company can be increased. And maybe to, to start here, the, the concept of an ordinary and a Conditional capital increase have essentially remained the same. So there were some flexibilizations, but no major changes. And the same also applies in relation to a classic capital decrease. Um, the major change here is that the authorized capital was replaced with a capital band. This is essentially an authorization of the board to increase and decrease the share capital with a sin, within a set upper and lower thresholds. Um, the maximum um, may, however, not be more than 50% above, and the minimum not, be, not more than 50% below the current share capital. Um, if a company also has conditional capital, which is, of course, often the case um, in startups because they use that to issue options under the, um, their employee um, incentive plan, the upper and lower thresholds of the, of the share capital or the capital band are dynamic. This means that whenever the board updates the share capital to register new option, it will also adjust the upper and lower threshold of the capital band. Um, the, the maximum duration of a capital band is five years, but it is automatically canceled before if the shareholders resolve on an ordinary capital increase or decide to keep the, the capital in a foreign, foreign currency um, going forward. Um, what, what does that mean? Basically, if you have a ordinary capital increase, you know, while having basically, you know, a capital band, you know, in your articles, then you need to resolve again on the capital band. Exactly. And what we, I mean, in, in, in the venture world, where the capital band likely will be used is to um, already reflect an extension. So you have um, an investment agreement and then you already provide for the option of a second closing. And then to create essentially a reserve for those shares, you would use the capital band. And whenever you, you make the first closing, you should ensure that in the public deed, you first resolve on the ordinary capital um, of ordinary capital increase, and then as a second agenda, agenda item on the capital band, because if you do it the other way around, then you directly cancel it again. So that is, it's also something that the commercial re register will, will double check when they review the public deed, because they have a very formal approach here. Um, yeah. so that's... Marion, has anything changed, you know, in regard to, you know, notary appointment or filings with the commercial register when doing a capital increase, you know, um, source from the capital band? Um, no, that has essentially remained the same as as it was practiced for the authorized capital increase. So you still need to file it. You, you still need to have a board resolution in front of a notary to actually 
implement a capital increase. And so a last question, you know, do you think that, you know, we're going to see more, you know, these capital bands, um, you know, just to give, you know, the board more power to do like the capital increases um, for future financing rounds, you know, to basically, you know, um, have the competence of the capital increases, you know, with the board instead of the shareholders. What do you what do you think? You know, is, is I'm I'm not sure about that because technically also on the on the um, authorized capital you you had almost similar options to do that. Maybe you, you only had two years instead of five years, but but still um I, I think the shareholders want to be involved and I think um it's also very difficult to already anticipate what what will be done in future rounds so you would have to ask the shareholders for a super broad waiver but technically yes um i mean you could use it um, i'm not sure if if this will actually be practiced because so far it has also been like typically you would involve the shareholders still um, thanks so much elaborating on that first yeah um there are certain aspects that have to be observed in capital crease, decreases within a capital band specifically the first is that um the the requirements governing the creditor protection still have to be observed so that like for a, a normal capital increase you would have to make creditor calls and possibly secure receivables and prepare interim financial statements. You would also have to involve the, the auditors to implement the capital decrease. Another important point is that capital increases on the basis of a capital band are not permitted if the company has opted out of the limited audit. And as you're probably aware, this is very often done in early phase start startups. Um, uh, so that that means basically, if you would like to do like a capital decrease, you would have to, you know, first elect um, auditors, right? Exactly, yes. And there's one important point that I I want to flag here, in and it's that under under Swiss tax law, the amount of the newly created capital reserve um, and of the stamp duty is assessed upon the end of the capital bond band only. Um, so um, tax authorities will look at it from a, a net perspective at the expiry or cancellation date of the capital band. Um, this is very technical, of course, but for, for you, it is important to, to keep in mind that capital in relation to capital decreases, this tax principle will likely lead to income and withholding taxes for the shareholders. Um, and the concept um, should therefore be carefully evaluated be before a capital band that also permits decreases and not only increases is implemented um, at the company level. And I think given these drawbacks and limitations, um, it remains to be seen in practice whether the, the capital band and these nice futures will be successful actually. Um, I think chances are that it might also only be used to replicate the, the concept of an authorized share capital as it was used today, essentially. And Mario, can we, you know, we have, we have quite a few questions from, from the audience. Are you okay, you know, if, if we cover a couple of those? Okay. So um, one question is from Martin, if a startup has already authorized capital from last year, is there a need to act um meaning to switch to capital band or can we keep using the authorized capital still in 2023 um you can still use the the authorized capital um as long as it remains the same so if you for example in, in march decide hey it would be nice if we could increase it then the commercial register would refuse the the application and say no actually now you need to create a capital band but as long as you just use the one that was created, you, you may do so. Um, maybe as a general rule here, the, the, the current articles, they remain in force for a period of two years. But, and then afterwards, the, the, 
the provisions that are not in line with the new law will become void. And that's that maybe to add here. Okay. So like, you know, to sum it up, there is no need for, you know, for companies basically to change the articles in that regard, you know, um, in the upcoming, you know, annual general meetings. Um, no, I mean, we will talk about some nice, things that will facilitate a startup's life, but that require that um, the amendment, uh, that the articles are amended, but just because you have to do it, um, like there's there's nothing. So um, you, you can wait for, for two years and it's just whenever you make a general revision of the articles, then you need to ensure that everything is updated to, to be aligned with the new law. And as long as you just make partial amendments of the articles, then you have to just to be ensure that that part that is amended is in line with the new law. And so um, another question from, from Pascal, you know, he, he his question is more like, okay, you know, now with the capital plan, you know, is it gonna replace the conditional capital, you know, for the future when it comes to, you know, um, incentive, you know, schemes and incentive plans, or incentive programs? No, the, the conditional capital bands, a uh, conditional capital can be kept as is, so that it is possible to have it within the capital band, but you can also keep it separately. And um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's that's it. Um, like other questions, you know, we we can we can still tackle those, you know, in our Q and A session at the end of our of our session. Okay. And then, um, as already promised, um, there's one topic that that affects the the startup community a lot, and it's how or what would happen to to convertible loans as we know them. Um, as most of you are aware, I'm sure, um, convertible loans are typically converted into equity through an ordinary or authorized capital increase. The latter would now, of course, be the capital band but the principles would remain the same. The revised law obliges a company to disclose the details regarding a conversion in the articles. This not only um, does not only the name of the lender, but also the shares he or she received in exchange and the claim um, that was set off um, needs to be disclosed. This may be seen as a threat to secrecy as the articles are publicly available. So essentially, everyone can order them from the commercial register. And of course, often startups and investors want to keep an investment confidential. I therefore assume that convertible loans will be structured differently in, in the future. Um, there are a couple of possibilities on how this can be achieved, but it still needs to be seen which which solution will will prevail in practice and this of course also depends on the commercial register the tax authorities and the auditors and the notaries as they have a say in that too we currently favor two solutions in in particular um in both solutions the the nominal value of of the relevant shares would have to be paid to a blocked account by the relevant lender this means that in addition to the loan that was already dispersed at an earlier stage, the lender at the time of conversions also pay, pays a certain low amount to, to a blocked account. In option one, one would then set the formal issue price at the nominal value and just contribute the entire loan claim in the company as a contribution into the capital reserve. Um, be aware, however, that this setup may potentially trigger some tax consequences. And again, this should of course be carefully assessed. And it's of course always advisable to obtain a ruling. In the second option, one would keep the issue price at the actual amount. This means it's typically the, the issue price that is applicable for the lead investor in a financing round, less a discount. And, and then the, the loan would just be set up with the premium only. The rationale for this solution is that the collection of the premium is a responsibility of the board. And 
at least according to the previous practice, it was not considered a contribution by virtue of set off if only the premium, but not the nominal value was set off. It can, of course, not be excluded, however, that this may change in the future. And yeah. You know, we do like a short recap about that. I mean, like the, the first solution, which is like super, super inconvenient, um, where you would have to disclose, you know, all the convertible note holders, you know, in your articles of incorporation, right? I mean, throughout, I don't know, a lifespan of, let's say, five years, maybe there are 30, 40, or even more yeah. um, lenders there. So this is like uh, yeah, a huge hassle. And so, and also like a big part of your cap table would then just be disclosed. Um, so that, I mean, yeah. you know the issue price, you know what amount they have, so you can calculate the number of shares as well. Um, everything is written essentially, yes. And so we have like like a second second option um, that would permit not to disclose, you know, the lenders basically if they pay the nominal value, and then you know the loan is basically you know um, waived and you know contributed as a um, into the capital reserves, right? Exactly. Yes. Um... What you have to be a bit careful here is that um, if the contribution is made before um, you're actually a shareholder or before the lender is a shareholder, um, this may trigger tax consequences because a contribution by someone who is not a shareholder um, might be regarded as profit um, from a tax perspective. Of course, it, it's not that, of that much relevance for the startups because it, it typically they, they do not have any profits anyway, but it may also have some impact or ha have some impact on the investor side um, or the shareholder side if if, if this is not not structured properly. And like the third option would be to that the convertible note holders pay the nominal value of the shares again. Mm -hmm. And then basically the board, you know, decides to use the loan, you know, to mm -hmm. pay in the, you know, the art show, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, already on the on, on the, the old law, you could just write in the public deed, um, yes, we confirm the nominal value has to be paid in, and the collection of, of the art show is the res responsibility of the board. And then it's essentially up to the board on in what way it... Um, it, it collects the art show. And at least as I mentioned under the previous law, even if you then decide, hey, we set it off with an existing claim, it was not considered a Verrechnungswidrig, you know. But obviously um, the authorities might see that differently, you know, and, and, and be not happy with that solution um, because. So it really remains to be seen whether, you know, how that practice is gonna evolve. And I mean, those two, you know, like, you know, options are not yet tested and yeah i mean people exactly. should definitely you know get some professional advice from you or from from someone else you know if they you know want to go you know um yeah if they want to opt for that right um, absolutely we are of course also aware of any changes and then we, we're in close contact with the commercial registers and notaries so we 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 will certainly be aware of what is the current practice. And I think it's very important to monitor that, yes. I think what is also like super, you know, like the, what also changes is that, you know, if you opt for for one of those options, you know, that the convertible loan holder, you know, needs to pay, you know, the nominal value, you know, into the blocked capital account, you basically also need to change the convertible note agreements, right? Exactly. Yeah, you should already anticipate a, a different structure, definitely. So, like the message to you know startups and investors also, you know, if you you know issue any convertible you know debt or loans, then you should definitely you know make sure that you somehow cover that, and so you can be flexible in whatever you know, um, whatever form you know, um, the deal will go through. Clear. Um. We have a lot of questions again. Oh. I'm having a hard. I'm having a hard time to cover all. 
yeah, just just go ahead, Marion. I okay. will quickly scroll through the question, and then we're gonna, you know, maybe you know, tackle yeah. some before we move to the Q and A. Yeah, I will try to to keep um, this slide brief, even though it's it's a very important topic because um, under the new law there are considerable flexi flexibilizations made um, in relation to the holding of shareholders meeting. It is now, for example, possible to hold meetings at two or more different venues at the same time. And you can also hold meetings abroad if this option is provided for in the article, articles of, of the company. Um, this does, however, not mean that the chairman can decide to, to hold the next um, ordinary shareholders meeting during his vacation on the Easter Island. The reason for that is that um, by the venue can be anywhere in the world, there still must be reasonable grounds for the choice. And just the beauty of a destination as such would not be sufficient because the reasons, of course, need to be somewhat connected to, to the company's business. And um, another big change um, that will bring about a lot of um, simplification is that now also on a shareholder level, you can take circular resolutions. And these resolutions may be taken in writing or in electronic form. And I will go into detail a bit later in the presentation as to what electronic forms exactly means. Um, this now also permitted to, to hold virtual meetings. Again, this is only possible if you have this option included in the articles. And lastly, of course, also a mix between uh, physical and a virtual participation is possible. The choice and setup of, of a digital, digital shareholders meeting is the board responsibility and it needs to ensure the integrity and transparency of, of, the, of the digital meeting and the voting process. Um, so let's imagine um, we're in the middle of a shareholders meeting and that is held over teams and then suddenly everything breaks down. Um, what would the chairman have to do? Um, so if technical issues arise during a virtual meeting, it needs to be reconvened. And for this reason, I strongly recommend that the startup or the company already announces a backup date in the original invitation. Otherwise, one has a, otherwise one has a risk um, that one has to wait another period of 20 days to finalize an interrupted meeting. Even if one person drops out, oh. then you would have to reconvene the meeting, right? Um, well, this is not applicable if the technical problems only fall within the sphere of an individual shareholder, luckily. Otherwise, it would get super complicated. Um, so, so yes, what, what I said is only if, if the actual, like the meeting organizer and, and therefore the majority of the meeting cannot be, be continued anymore. And maybe to, to add here, um, any resolutions that were taken before such problems occurred still remain valid. Well, that's... Um, and as probably most of you, sorry. Martin, just, just a couple of questions, you know, regarding the shareholders meeting, you know, like maybe, you know, from a, from a practical point of view, you know, can you, you know, walk us, you know, through, you know, the steps, how to set up like a full virtual meeting, um, just to, you know, be compliant with the new, you know, um, regulations. Mm -hmm. So the, the new regulations are drafted quite broadly. So there are no requirements on, on the tools you have to use and, and what the process um, exactly is. Um, I, I think in the future, there will probably also be professional providers, which exactly have the, the tools to, to ensure that you can identify everyone and, and so on. But I think we are, we are not quite there yet. So for now, um, let's say if you want to hold uh, team meetings, then of course you should include the, the login details in, in the invitation. And, um, and then the board essentially needs to, to be able to 
or needs to ensure that that the participants are um, identified and that the I identity is established. And I think that's probably the main the main difficulty to ensure that no unauthorized persons attend and and even vote shares. And so that's especially if you know the shareholders um prefer to remain anonymous right i mean how do you basically do the identification if everyone else is listening yeah um maybe you could do some some sort of pre-registration um like a pre-chat where, where um i think like it, it remains to be seen in practice what on how this this can be done in particular for larger companies. I think on on a startup level, you, you can still handle it quite easily. And also, typically, the shareholders know each other from the shareholders agreement anyway. So um, then you probably do not have have this problem. But of course, a listed company, they they would really have to ensure that everything is done done by the books. And um, yeah. And what about circular resolutions? You know. Um you know, passed on a shareholder level? I mean, how would you, you know, how would you set it up? How would you, how would you, how would you do it? Um, I mean, um, <clears throat> um, you, if, again, if it's a smaller, um, uncomplicated company, then you, you can essentially do it already by exchanging emails, but, um, but as soon as there are more parties involved and, and in order to avoid any misunderstandings, it's probably wise to pre-write the resolution and then um, maybe circulate a form that one can make across or, or, or write below, I agree. Um, that, that would prob probably be the, the best, best approach here. Do you think, you know, like, like um, tools like DocuSign, um you know are are suitable for oh yes for, okay i mean that for, would for be resolutions probably the 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 easiest and still proper solution uh, when, when i'm i'm going to talk about that in, in a bit more in detail um in relation to the board resolution because it affects both bodies of the company um yes um as as mentioned, probably on on the board level, um, everyone is familiar with, with um, uh, circular and, and virtual meetings already because it was common practice under the previous law already. And similar to what I said in relation to shareholders meeting, it of course needs to be ensured that the meeting and the voting process is transparent and correct. Um, the big change here is that. Circular resolutions may now also be taken in electronic form. And this means, uh, as we have just mentioned, not only DocuSign and similar tools, but essentially also over WhatsApp chats and emails. And however, still not a, a good idea to just file a screenshot of a WhatsApp chat with, with the commercial register. And the reason for that is that the commercial register um, ordinance still um, provides that um, the relevant documents need to be executed in handwriting or at least by virtue of a, a qualified electronic signature and a, a screenshot of a WhatsApp group does, does not fulfill that requirement. And maybe to add here, um, a startup should of course, like you, despite its flexibilities, it should still be kept in mind that um, resolutions also serve a, evidentiary purposes and should therefore be carefully documented and be kept in the company files. And again, to, to bring up the example with, with the WhatsApp group, this is probably not done in practice, then um, it will just get lost and, and you can't trace it anymore. And in addition, also very important for, for startup, um, please keep in mind that you may have to disclose the resolution to third parties at a later stage. And Let's say you approve the new business plan in the WhatsApp group of the last company's Christmas party. And this will probably not leave the best impression with a potential investor that is conducting a due diligence. Or at 3 a.m. with a couple of smileys and typos yeah, in there. Exactly. So it just, I think 
yes, we now have these vast, vast opportunities to, to conduct that, uh, or to, to resolve on matters, but I think these points still need to be kept in mind. So the, the filing with the commercial register, the documentation purposes, and, and also disclosure aspects. I still reflect on you, right? How, the way you take, you know, to pass the resolutions. And I mean, it's also, you know, probably, you know, um, a, a good, you know, decision to basically, you know, decide on one of, on the one electronic communication, you know, tool and not use, you know, WhatsApp and then SMS and then email and, then, you know, DocuSign. So we have like a large variety. Yeah, it's probably also, you know, um, yes makes sense to opt for one and not for several. Exactly. Um, so, um, Marian, I have a like, question, you know, like now, you know, that, you know, shareholder resolutions can be, you know, passed, you know, in virtual meetings or by circle resolution, you know, um, like how do you how is the interplay you know with the with the notaries and the commercial register? I mean, would I mean how do I get a capital increase you know notarized when having a virtual meeting or a circle resolution? How does that work? I mean, do startups or investors you know need to show up at a notary, um, or can that be done remotely? Um, yes, yeah, so um. Circular resolutions are, are rather difficult um, to notarize because essentially the person needs need to be present somehow. So I think that will be the, the super difficult topic. And um, in relation to, to other like the notarization of, of virtual meetings, for example, it depends on cantonal legislation as well. Um, I think in, in the canton of Bern, for example, like you can, um, notarized facts um, so that's possible um, also if the notary is just um in a in, or links logs in into a team link so that's that's permissible but what cannot be done yet is um if in german it's called willensbeurkundungen um there um the law is is rather strict and one would still have to be present but um at least our notaries in in, in Bern, um they or like when when the the board needs to to make a, a confirmation of the capital increase, that is something that could essentially be done virtually. But again, it might vary from canton to canton. So much. Um, so we um already get to the last major topic that I want to discuss today. It's a very important one for startup and it's how it, a company needs to deal with with financial difficulties and um, I see that the time has already progressed quite much so I will try try to to keep it um, short um, what is important to, to keep in, in mind here is that um, the the relevant provisions have been fundamentally revised and the, the aim was that a company initiates restructuring steps as early as possible, and therefore the entire early warning system um, needed to be um, or was redesigned. Um, the, the, the provision um, governing a capital loss and, and over indebtedness has now have now been supplemented by the concept of imminent insolvency. This means that in addition to the debt and the equity that the board needed to monitor under the old law, um, it also needs to, to monitor, explicitly monitor the solvency of the company. However, of course, already under the new law, the board had, um, of course, an obligation to assess, um, to know whether the company can be, pay the bills of the next month. Um, so essentially the obligation and consequences um, to monitor the solvency have to now um, be more clearly written. Um, if there is a risk that, that the company may become insolvent, the board would have to take sh certain measures, measures that follow a three-step cascade. Um, 
the definition and, and also the measures that um, board could take if, if the company has suffered a capital loss have essentially remained the same. And what has changed here is that a shareholders meeting um, now only needs to be convened if the measures that a, a board wants to take to, to eliminate a capital loss actually fall the com within the competence of, of a shareholders meeting. So under the old law, you always, when you had a capital loss, were obliged to convene a, a shareholders meeting as soon as possible and then propose measures. Um, and a very important point here um, that is new as well is that the financials will have to be reviewed by a licensed auditor if they show a capital loss. This is also applicable for companies who have made an opting out. Um, in this case, the, uh, the board would have to appoint an ad hoc auditor. And if this is omitted or forgotten, the shareholders meeting may then on the ordinary shareholders meeting not validly approve the financials. And chances are, however, that ex especially companies that have not appointed any auditors, and as I said before, this is often the case in early stage startup, do not even notice that they have a capital loss, however. Um, and then also considering that the financials of the of startups due to the high burden rate and the low revenues often show a capital loss. This is certainly a potential pit up, pitfall for, for many startups in particular. And not only the fact that, that the startup has a capital loss, but also that the financials were not validly approved um, because no, no audit was made is certainly something that um, an investor would flag in a due diligence. Like other than that, I mean, like, what are you know what are the consequences if you don't observe or comply with that? Let's um, say, I mean, you have a capital loss, as many startups, you know, do you don't elect auditors, you know, to approve the financial or yeah to approve the financial statements, and then you just you know and um, continue to operate, you know, as no, uh, as usual. Yeah, it, it, essentially, yes. I mean, this oh, essentially a lot of things that is, or, or a lot of obligations, um, even if they are not observed um, once the company is still operating, and then maybe you make a good financing round, then no one will in the backside or care that, that you didn't comply with this provision. Um, but it becomes relevant um, once you become bankrupt, because that's when court and creditor and everyone will look um, into details what you have done or what you have forgotten to do or did not do on purpose. That's so, so yeah, that that also means if you have you know board members that are you know not the founders, they may want you know the financial statements to be audited if there is a capital loss because they. You know, may face you know personal liability if 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 the company goes bankrupt, right? Yeah, and we we see it um quite often, honestly, that that as soon as investors um that are a bit I would say more than friends and family only um invest in the company, and that's typically the stage where um startups would are often required to to um appoint auditors um. We see that quite often in the in the investment agreement that it's really an obligation to to appoint auditors. It's quite a, a high, you know, I would say a high standard, right? That is required now. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, what would you recommend? You know, if 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 comp if like a startup, you know, knows okay, um, probably we have a capital loss, then you know just First, convene a, uh, a general meeting to elect, you know, auditors. Or what is the what is the way forward? No, no. Actually, the well, if you have a capital loss, then the the board needs to assess well what what do you want to do about it. And if it, for example, taking out loans, that is not something that affects the shareholders. So um, you would not have to convene a shareholders meeting just to let the shareholders know that, hey, we're going to take loan, out loans. That, 
that was actually practiced under the, the previous law. And, and also to appoint the auditors, you would not have to convene one because the board would appoint them ad hoc. So that would, no, no shareholders meeting required for that, which makes it of course a lot easier. Um, then maybe um, to move to the, to the next topic, um, also the, the definition of an over indebtedness has not, not changed. Um, so if, if a company is over indebted, if its assets do no longer cover the liabilities. Um, if the, the board is concerned that there may, the company may indeed be over indebted, it has to prepare interim financial statements at going concern values and at liquidation values. And again, such financials would have to be auditor. And if there is no statutory auditors, the board would have to appoint one ad hoc. Um, if the financials show that, that the company is over indebted, um, the board has an obliga obligation to notify the court. Um, this notification may be omitted um, if creditors subordinate their claims to the extent of the over indebtedness. One important point that is new here is that, this, that a subordination in order to be valid also needs to cover the interest that is due during the, the period of, of over indebtedness. And pursuant to the transitional provisions, um, the new law will upon um, the expiry of a grace period also be applicable in relation to already existing contracts. And of course, an invalid subordination could create a lot of issues for a startup. Um, I therefore strongly recommend that startups really check on all contracts that include subordination clauses, um, whether to assess whether the interest is also covered. And in our field, I of course, primarily um, refer to convertible loans, loan agreements, of course, um, which are in most instances subordinated. In addition, um, the court does not have to be notified um, if there's reasonable grounds to believe that the over indebtedness will be cured swiftly. The new law um, defines that the maximum period on, on what can be considered swiftly is 90 days after the financials are available. The, the principle was already practiced under the current law. So far, there was, however, no clear deadline. And whereas pursuant to the majority um, of scholars and practitioners, a company had between four to six weeks, there were also scholars which argued for considerable longer periods. And Whereas this fixed time frame of exactly 90 days gives, of course, legal certainty, it is also rather short and does not allow for a, a lot of flexibility. And as we all know, startups are quite often over indebted and financing rounds are executed at the very last second. And this, this therefore, of course, imposes an additional burden on, on startups. Thanks so much, Marion. Are you are you ready to wrap this up? Um, yes, I'm just getting to the to the last slide. Um, maybe a, a super short recap. Um, there were some major changes, and it's therefore recommended to review um, certain documents, and this includes the articles. As mentioned, you can essentially wait two years, but if you want to hold um, shareholders meeting abroad or virtual shareholders meeting, you might want to amend them before because otherwise you do not have these options. Um, please also review and revise if necessary other documents such as organizational regulations or shareholders agreements. And again, double check any agreements that include subordination clauses to ensure that also the interest is covered. Um, Lastly, or ensure that the financial situation of the company is monitored. Um, keep in mind that you now also need to, to um, monitor the solvency of the company in addition to a capital loss and an over indebtedness. And also, please keep in mind that depending on the financial situation, you may no longer be entitled to make an opting out. 
lastly, another big point when entering into new convertible loan agreements, keep in mind that all the details will have to be disclosed at the time of conversion. So um, if this is not desired, then um, already assess at the beginning whether there are other structuring options available that might be more suitable. And yes, with this, um, we have already come, come to the end um, of the presentation. I, I really love I really love this slide, Marion. The action items, yeah, I think you know um, that will be super helpful for the startups. And I mean, given that you know um, it's already one p.m., um, we're gonna basically you know move the the Q and A session, you know, just like you know um, on like online per email. So if you know the audience or anyone you know listening to this and um, would like to you know ask a follow-up question then yeah please reach out to marion okay. and yeah thank you so much for you know joining our um Cictic academy webinar and you know um showing us what's relevant you know going forward with that new corporate law and yeah um, thanks a lot thank you very much all right then um, we're going to close this session. And um, yeah, please, for you know, all the people who have listened to this um, webinar, um, yeah, um, if you haven't reached out you know, to SICTIC, please um, do it. We would you know, be thrilled to welcome you at our next event. You can download our um, Angel Investor Handbook if you're interested you know, in learning about you know, angel investing. And that's it. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye, everyone.